right, well, um, I'm excited to have Emily here. Emily, what's your actual title with Belmont? Like Belmont East Mentor or something? Or what do I am the program advisor for the Belmont East students. So we, of course, facilitate the admissions process on our side, but the students that go out and study in New York, um, Emily is their contact and guide and resource and mentor. And um, So anyway, she's here in town for all sorts of fun stuff, and we thought we'd bring her in. Oh my goodness, there are so many of you. If some of y'all want to sit like on the stairs, you are welcome to stand against the wall, but you want to sit. Um, anyway, I'm glad to have her here, and we're just going to kind of talk through her career from graduating until today, what she's up to. Um, she's currently with uh, AAM, which is Ad wait, Alternative Advanced Alternative Media. Thank you. I get the A's mixed up every time I try to say it. Um, and she is a producer, writer, manager, as well as she does a smattering of other things, and I'll have her talk about that some more later. But, um, oh, and Emily wanted to know, okay, how many freshmen do we have in the room? I don't know why there's like murmurs about that. Okay, how many sophomores? Okay, juniors, seniors, and MBU majors, AET majors, EIS, songwriting. What about uh, commercial music majors? I always forget y'all, sorry. I'm sorry for forgetting all the time. All the time. Um, okay, Emily, so you finished in 08, yes, at Belmont, MBU. Yep. And then how, I mean, how did you land your first job? So basically I was at Belmont, um, and then my senior year I did Belmont East, and I went out and I worked for a company called BMI, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And I worked in the writer-publisher relations office. And my boss at the time at BMI, was the same person who was teaching the entertainment in New York class. And so him and I became really close, and he just sort of, I got really lucky, honestly. He just sort of took me to every meeting and every breakfast and every, every show and just really just let me get my hands dirty with it. So uh, after... I think someone leaned against the lights. <laughs> 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 During, so that was the first semester of my senior year. During the second semester of my senior year, I went back to New York over spring break. And I just set up a bunch of meetings and interviews with everyone that I had met while I was in New York. Um, and I just, I got lucky. I went and interviewed at a music law firm, because at the time I thought I wanted to go to law school. Uh, the two partners that I interviewed with offered me the job in March. They said that they would hold it for me until May. So I came back, finished up, and went back to New York two days after graduation. Started work on that Monday and just kept going ever since. It's been about five years, so. Crazy. So tell us what your, kind of your daily job responsibilities responsibility looked like when you were working at the law firm. So I worked for two of the partners. It was a really big music and entertainment law firm, but it was, uh, it was about nine partners there, and the, the two that I worked for represent John Mayer and Ray LaMontagne and The Fray, um, and they also represented a bunch of hip-hop artists, and they admined their publishing catalogs. So that was the year that that song Party Like a Rockstar came out on the shop. Well, yes, it's, it's unfortunate that I have memories of that. But there's, uh, so they admined that catalog, and that song had just come out, and it was licensed. You heard it everywhere, and we did all the licensing for that. So I learned how to draft my own licenses for film and TV use and for special digital uses and for just kind of anything that you can imagine that that song would be placed in. We, we learned how to do that. And so I admin those catalogs for about a year and a half once I sort of figured out how to do it. And I also did all of their copyright and trademark law stuff that was that you can do without being an attorney. It's just sort of like filing papers and that kind of stuff. So I worked for them for two years. Um, and because of that, I learned the administrative side of licensing, which took me into the next two jobs that I had in New York. So two years after the law firm, or is that the law firm for two years, and then I left and I went to a record label called Mom and Pop Records. And I did all of their licensing paperwork for a bunch of the bands that were not signed to a publishing deal yet. So at the time, it was Sleigh Bells, and we had some of the new Ingrid Michaelson songs, Joshua Radin's new album, uh, Freelance Wales, Tokyo Police Club. So a bunch of bands that were really heavily licensed. And so I did, um, I just sort of kept track of all of those and sort of helped negotiate the terms lightly and kind of get everything organized until those bands ended up getting signed to publishing deals and then obviously the publishing companies took over the administration stuff. Um, so I was at the record label for a year 
And then the, the guy that I worked for was the head of, the president of the label was a guy named Michael Goldstone, who was a pretty famous A&R guy. He signed Pearl Jam and Rage Against the Machine and Regina Spector and whatever. So we worked together for a year and then I left the label and went to a company called The Press House. And it was a media and PR company that had been up and running for about 13 years. And she was looking for someone to start a film and TV licensing department for her. So I started the film and TV licensing department from scratch. And we ended up pitching about 50 bands and got a bunch of placements on all the ABC family shows and, you know, like the normal network shows. We did a campaign with Eddie Bauer. We did a campaign with Foxhead Merch. We did um, a bunch of cool, like, online placements for, like, Google and stuff. Um, and then that was up and running. And then, and then when that was sort of, like, you know, ran its course, I moved over to AAM. And now I've been at AAM for about a year and three months. Okay, backing up a little bit. Did you think your first job out of Belmont would be with an entertainment law firm? I did because at the time I wanted to go into entertainment law. Um, and so obviously there's really no place to go and learn that than an uh, entertainment law firm. Yeah. And then, okay, jumping forward to creating a film and TV licensing division from scratch. I mean, talk us through that. How, I mean, how did you know, how did you know to do? Well, what did you do? <laughs> I didn't. I faked a lot of it. Um, so, kind of when you, when I got hired for the job, I told her, I was like, I know the administrative side of things really well. And because of that, I know all of the music, well, not all of them, but I have good relationships with all the music supervisors just from a different side of what they need licensing companies to do. So, I understand how to run the back end of the licensing company. Um, and so it was really just figuring out how to go forward once you had all the nuts and bolts in place. Um, so we had, you know, we got the back end put up, we got the website and everything ready to go. All of our pitches were done, all of our compilations were ready, um, all of our artists were cleared. And then at that point, it was just sort of hitting the pavement and making relationships with all the music supervisors. So they learned to trust you and trust your taste and listen to the music that they send you or that you send them. Um, and then just sort of kind of figure out how to keep them engaged without annoying them so eventually they'll pick some of your songs and that's just sort of what happened. It took us, I would say, four months to actually launch the department and it took us about seven months to actually get a placement and once we got our first placement they all just kind of started rolling in which is really exciting. And so you're, in your first three jobs as you're hopping from one thing to the next, were you looking for some a new experience specifically or were you kind of like done with that so you're just trying to move on to anything new or what was, what was the purpose and the motive behind I think, new jobs. I think what you'll find is that um, your first job out of college is not going to be your dream job. It's just, if, you, if it is, you're incredibly lucky, but it's probably not going to be. So when you, when you take that job, I think it's important to do really well at that job, learn as much as you can, but also realize that you're going to have to kind of think ahead about what the end goal is and what sort of makes sense for you to get there. Um, when I was a freshman, I wanted to work in live music. I wanted to be a promoter. And by the time I graduated, I completely sort of changed my mind, not because I didn't want to work in live music anymore, but just because I found that um, I just found a different road and sort of stuck with it. So I think that you have to kind of, you have to be thinking about those next steps. So I didn't, once I realized I didn't want to go to law school, I never thought that I would be working in film and TV licensing, and I never thought that I'd be working in management. I never wanted to manage bands. I think, and if there's anyone in here that does want to manage bands or currently does manage bands, I'd take my hat off to you because I can't imagine wanting to babysit five grown-ups for, you know, day in, day out and have it be four bands at a time. It's just not something that I want to do. Um, and then, and, and somehow I ended up in management. So things change. Um, as you know, as you sort of like get further and further into your career, and you just kind of have to be willing to go with the flow and make sure that you know that all the moves that you're making um, are, if they're lateral, make sure it's because you want to learn something new. And if not, you just kind of have to try to hop up the ladder slowly and just learn as many things as you can. Because the more experience that you have when you're when you're able to be at an entry level, the more you're going to realize it's easier to get farther and farther up and just sort of get into those management positions and, you know, those president, vice president, whatever positions. Yeah. So. so you you had no desire to do management None and whatsoever. then you take a job at AM. So talk us through that. I mean, so I was working at the press house and the woman who hired me at AAM had been there for about 20 years and she and I knew each other just from being out and socially in New York 
she called and said, we had this job open, we, you know, we think that you'd be great for it. We've heard your name from a couple people, do you want to come in and interview? And I said, I'm not looking right now, but yes, I would like to just come in and talk to you about it. Uh, so I went in and we talked for a couple hours and it sort of just made sense. And basically my role at AAM was to come in, just a brief history about AAM so you sort of know what the company is before I talk about this. Like, it's a management company and it started off as a promotions company and we now manage writers and producers. So the biggest client that we have is Dr. Luke. Um, Dr. Luke does all of the, everything on Top 40 Radio, basically. And any song that you dance to when you're out and about, you can thank our office for. So we manage Dr. Luke, and we manage all of his, all of his writers. He has a publishing company of about 28 to 34 writers, just sort of depending on the day. And, um, and so that's like our biggest, that's our biggest client that we have. But we started off in the rock side. So we manage Andy Wallace, who made Nirvana Nevermind and a bunch of those really great rock records. Um, and he's still a client. And then we also have a lot of guys that do like the Rob Zombie records and the Creed records and like those really big records that none of you listen to but do make a lot of money still. So uh, we, that's sort of, that's kind of like where the company sort of started. And it also is filtered out to having a lot of different kinds of producers. So I got hired to nurture the alternative and indie rock and somewhat electronic part of our roster that still existed but hadn't had anybody to really kind of bring in you know new ideas and fresh producers and all that kind of stuff so that's why I got hired um, and that's sort of the world that I live in at AAM on the producer writer side of things. Great. So tell us more, I mean what does it look like to nurture those relationships or nurture those producers to, to look for other folks that you want to bring on? So it's producer writer management is sort of a foreign concept to people. Um, especially in Nashville because publishers are so hands-on with their clients and with their roster. Um, but in the rest of, you know, the world, they're not. They're sort of just, um, they're not banks, but for all intents and purposes for explaining this, they're sort of just like banks. And so producer writer managers step in and sort of help the creative process along the same way that bands have managers to do the day-to-day -day stuff. So I manage, I have, um, eight producers that are sort of all over the country and, and in the UK as well. And then I also have three producer writers in Nashville as well. So uh, kind of what you do, it, most of my guys have pretty decent discographies already. So a lot of the work just comes from the reputation that they've, that they've had and that they've done. Um, but it's really fun on this side, on the management side of things, because you get to be creative. And I'm, I'm sort of a child of the way that I was, you know, raised to network in New York. Like, I'm out every night, I go to a lot of shows, um, I, I have a really, really big network there and in LA, um, here, all over the place. So you can kind of be able to call on the people that you've been working with for years to say, what band did you just sign? What's the sound? What kind of record are they trying to make? You should try this, you know, this band with this producer, because a lot of times people don't think to look that far. Bands usually do their research, good A&R people usually do their research, but you know, sometimes it's kind of like you go to the you go to the normal mixers that are going to charge you an arm and a leg and not really make that much of a difference. It's kind of nice to be able to pair up, you know, some of our clients with some bands that would have just used uh, Rich Costi or a Tom Lord Algae or something like that, and kind of just say, here's what we have, here's who you know, here's who they've worked with. You should try and kind of like think outside the box. So it's a little bit of a matching game, and it's really fun. Um, and then also, it's a lot of you know, it's a lot of paperwork, it's a lot of lawyers, it's a lot of budgets. So. It's 50-50 of creative and administrative, and my brain really works both ways. So it's it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting spot. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, AAM, I mean, recently brought on Comedian Records, or how? So when I when I got brought to AAM, along with the alternative and indie side of things on the roster, they also wanted me to open up the Australia and UK relationships because I did a lot of work again in film and TV with those two territories. So last October, there's a record label called Communion Records, which is based in the UK. It's owned by Ben Lovett, who's in Mumford & Sons, a guy named Ian Grimble, who's a producer in the UK, and another guy named Kev Jones, who's in a band called Bear's Den in the UK. Um, it started seven years ago in London as a promotions company. Uh, they, all the guys were in bands, and they were just basically like, we keep getting ripped off by promoters, so we want to find a way to have a successful club night where bands can come and play, actually make money, not walk away getting screwed, and have people come and enjoy it and just sort of like have a good time going to a show. Um, and that's now grown to, um, there's like 11 live nights 
in London, or in the UK, there's two in Australia. There's one in Nashville on Thursday at the basement. You should all come. Uh, and then there's one in New York. There's going to be one in Chicago soon, San Francisco, LA. Um, and we're just going to keep expanding. So it also became a record label two years ago. Um, and the first band that they signed, or the first guy that they signed is a guy named Matthew and the Atlas. Um, and then also we put out the Ben Howard record here and the Michael Kiwanuka record here. Uh, we just signed a band called Deep Valley. We're working with a guy called Willie Mason. So we're doing a lot of um, releases in the UK and in the last year those bands have all been sort of imported into the US. So last year when I met the guys in Communion, they didn't really have any bodies on the ground in the US. Um, and because of the way that AAM is set up, we have a fully functional college radio promotions department. Myself and our artist manager at the company named Matt Watts, we just sort of met the guys and really liked them. It's very artist friendly. And so we sort of just have developed it into a full blown working relationship. So the, U the US label of communion is going to run through AAM. So we're going to manage the, all of the releases and all oversee most of the live stuff just to kind of make sure that it's all going according to plan. So it sounds, I mean, I was joking with Emily earlier, like, so when do you sleep and have a personal life? So, because it sounds like you do, I mean, minimum two people, two, a two-person job, probably more like a four or five-person job. So um, on a daily basis, like, how, how are you prioritizing? What are, what are you prioritizing? Um, it changes every day. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard, but the music industry doesn't make as much money as it used to. Um, so you're probably going to find for the first, you know, forever of your career, you're going to be doing a little bit more work than uh, you signed up for, but it's really fun and the synergies between all the stuff that you're going to be doing uh, is kind of mind-boggling because you can kind of just bleed everything into one giant pot. So how do I prioritize? Um, ideally when I go to bed and my checklist is in my head, I would wake up and it would be able to run smoothly, but that's usually not the case. Um, Something gets lost in the mail, someone didn't sign a contract, some band didn't show up to a session, the records are still on a barge leaving the UK. You know, it just changes every day. Um, so you just sort of have to be able to crisis manage and realize that what we do is supposed to be fun. So when something hits the fan and it just seems like it's going to totally ruin your day, at the end of it, as long as you get your stuff done, no one died. And it's supposed to be sort of a lighthearted stress and not like the kind of stress that some of our other friends have when they're like, you know, at a hospital trying to save a life sort of thing. Um, so you just kind of have to just go with the punches and roll with it and, and just see, uh, you get the hang of knowing what's actually urgent and when someone's just sort of finding something to complain about, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, I could ask Emily questions all day, but what questions do y'all have for her? Yeah. Um, I'm going to be out of school five years in May. So, and that, I mean, I interned all four years at Belmont and, you know, I think two or three years leading up to college. So, um, you just, just keep adding to it, you know, it doesn't really, and it doesn't really have to make, it doesn't really make a difference what you put on there, especially as an intern. I think people sort of look at diversity and find that a really big strength. I taught you that much already. <laughs> so Mind blown, yeah. What are your future plans? Um, well, my future plans are AAM for the next four years because that's how long my contract is with them. And then uh, hopefully if things are going the way that they're going at a company like that, just to sort of be, um, just to kind of figure it out from then and just see it's kind of hard to project that far ahead because things change so quickly. Um, but yeah, I think that the future plans are to sort of eventually be sustainable at a company that either I still really enjoy working for or to kind of start my own and create a collective of people I like working with and figuring out how it benefits the industry and the artists that we work for. Yeah. Uh, we hear all the time how much the industry is shrinking, especially uh, major labels. Mm -hmm. But uh, you were able to get out of college and find a job, and kudos to you, Ted, that's awesome. Um, what would you say is at least an uh, aspect of the industry that's at least staying steady, if not expanding? Um, labels, major labels are shrinking. Uh, indie labels are sustaining. I think that it's interesting to look at um, anything digital. 
uh, anything social media, obviously. Um, and think outside the box a little bit. Don't think that it has to be, you, you know, to get a job in the music industry, you don't have to be at a label, you don't have to be at a radio station, you don't have to be a publishing company. You can be, you know, you can go into branding or some sort of marketing, even licensing from the film side, you know, not necessarily the placement side. So think outside the box a little bit and don't be afraid to venture outside of what you've sort of been taught the music industry is because sometimes the best way to get into it is sort of like backdoor it and kind of figure out ways to, to learn everything that the people that have been in the music industry for a really long time aren't really adapting to. Um, it's, it's, there's, there are a lot of jobs out there. I would just like to say that there are a lot of jobs out there for everyone who's sort of been like, hearing some discouraging words, you just have to know where to look to find them. It's not going to be at a record label. It's just, it's not, unless you start your own, you know? Thank you. 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 General respect for people's time. <laughs> New York is really, an, it's, a, it's a really amazing place to work, but it's definitely a culture that's different than Nashville. Um, Nashville is very old school and it's very respected the way that there's certain, there's certain rules that have been followed for a while here. And I think in New York, um, they have their own set of rules too, but they're just sort of not very user friendly sometimes. But it's very fast paced and it's really fun and it's you know you can be just as creative there as you can here. Um, it's it's if you can if you can handle the city, uh, you can handle the business out there. So you said that you didn't plan to go into management when you first started studying here at Belmont. So when you got into the workforce and started actually getting your hands on that kind of stuff, what was kind of the I guess the the biggest part of that learning curve, like what was the hardest part about adapting to that different side of the industry that you hadn't planned on? The, the biggest <laughs> learning curve of getting into management after all those years? Um, having 12 clients that want to talk to you for an hour every day. Um, to kind of like, to strategize with 12 different, 12 different careers and 12 different genres and 12 different brains and to go into management you really have to sort of give up a level of, you have to have a level of selflessness even when it's completely absurd what, what you're doing. And I think that that's with anything. If anybody ends up as an assistant when they first um, leave school, which is you know probably gonna be the majority of you if you do find jobs. And that's the best, honestly, being an assistant right out of college is the best way to learn anything. Um, but you do have to adapt to someone else who is very tunnel visioned on their their career because we have a lot of different things to think about as managers but each client that you have only thinks about one thing and that's their that's their career um, and so you have to be able to compartmentalize all those things and I think that that was the hardest thing because I went from working working by myself and running a department to then sort of going into a position where there were a lot of different conversations and needs that ha you know that had to be met and couldn't really be delegated um. So I was curious to know, so I, my band for the community show is in Nashville, the last one. Which one? What's your band? Uh, Orange Oh, you played our show in New York, too. Yeah, we played You guys were great. Last week. And, uh, <laughs> Just uh, kidding, I recognized you. Oh, really? <laughs> 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 uh, but, sorry, I, I just was curious to know, um, we, so we got offered, we released, we released this album in January, uh, and I think like six or seven months ago, uh, we're actually offered a U.S. deal through Convenient, mm -hmm. um, and now, like, we turned it down um, just because we felt like we weren't ready and everything. And, um, so now, after last week, we've been in talks with uh, Jamie Hemsill, yeah. and uh, he is like leaning towards a UK deal as a more viable option. I just didn't know, like, what since you said you were involved with their um, the community over there as well, like, what what is AIM's involvement look like in that process? So. Jamie's the GM of Communion right. for all territories. AAM is going to be managing all the U.S. releases, but still reporting directly to Jamie. Um, and then Jamie has his label infrastructure for all of the U.K. sort of their U.K. office, and then our U.S. office are going to be separate unless we have a, both territories released. Okay. Yeah. So your involvement in a U.K. deal is you know, 
if any, you know, we're, we're all involved in all the projects, um, and we, the, but we're more focused on anything that gets put out directly in the U.S. And the U.K. office has the d different relationships than we do to sort of help whatever they release out there. Um, and obviously, if there's ever anything imported to the U.S., we would be, we would, we would do all of that. Okay. Yeah. Jamie's in town this week, so I'm sure you're going to see him. Yeah, he gets in tomorrow. Between LA, Nashville, New York, what's been your favorite area to work in the industry? New York. Yeah. Followed by Nashville, and I hate LA. <laughs> <laughs> Why LA? I don't know why. Oh, are you? Yeah. I just, it's so much driving. Yeah. It's so counterproductive to me. I can't take it. <laughs> yeah. um, have you always had a hard work ethic, or is that something you? I don't know. <laughs> I guess I've always had it. <laughs> yeah, I guess I've always had it. Yeah. But I think it can be learned. I think, you know, I give uh, prospective students and parents the admissions pitch occasionally at 7. We have one every single day at 1 o'clock. There is someone here every day, Monday, Wednesday, I mean, Wednesday through Friday, except for like Christmas season, to hear about Beaumont and Curve College. And and I tell them, like, if you're not a hustler and you're not willing to put in the work and get the internships and um, if it scares you to think that your peers are, like, your community and your network but also competition, and if that, if that just seems like a little bit too much, this isn't the place for you. And, um, and I know that still, I know students still come to Belmont and still feel that way. And some of you may feel that way. Like, I, maybe I'm lost or maybe this isn't... Um, I don't want it as much as you know my roommate, or um, and maybe maybe you don't, and maybe it is time to talk about transitioning to something else. But it also can be learned, and you can decide tonight that you are going to start living intentionally throughout the rest of your Belmont career and pursuing things beyond. So you know, don't be. Yes, a lot of you are born with like innate great work ethic, and that's awesome. But some of you have to work hard at your work ethic, um, but you can choose to do that. So don't feel. Don't feel uh, Debbie Downer-ish that you haven't had three internships prior to Belmont and then like been interning forever since. Yeah. Why did you turn turn away from it again? Why did I? Yeah, did um. I tore away from entertainment law because it just wasn't creative enough for me. Like, there's definitely a hustle in there. You have to, you know, you have to get new clients and you have to find them. But there's no shopping. There's no, you know, there's some shopping. There's some involvement, but you don't really, you're not involved in like the creative process of them becoming successful. Um, and that just to me was, I felt would, it would get very daunting not being able to sort of be hands on with that. So I just decided to veer away and go to a label and see if I like that better. And I just sort of haven't really looked back. But if, I mean, but entertainment law is incredibly interesting, um, especially with the more interesting ways that bands are integrating themselves into just being just having a career with like the branding and the, the touring and all that kind of stuff so if it is something that you're interested in there's a lot to do um, it just to me wasn't creative enough so do you have an opportunity to like go for something but you're going to kind of be in over your head if you get it should you like try that like would you recommend um I mean, I did, <laughs> but I do recommend it. I just think that you have to be, you have to just sort of map out the pros and cons of A, how over, how over your head, how, um, how upfront you would be able to be with whoever's offering you the job that it might not be something that you're 100% able to do, um, and make sure that you would have a support system around you to kind of help field any questions that you have and not sort of be too timid to ask because, you know, there's literally nothing worse than being in a job where you don't know what you're doing and don't have anyone to ask. Um, that's sort of when you get into trouble. You're not going to know everything every time you get hired for something. It's a lot of it's going to be personality and sort of just if they see that you can do it and they're sort of who you want representing that position. Um, so if it's not like, I mean, if someone's asking you to be like the president of a major label, I would step back and say like, how many more times do I need to read that Passman book? But if you, <laughs> you know, if, you, if it's something that's if it's something that's manageable, if you have the right support system, I would, I would definitely 100% say do it. Because at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, it, it's going to be because they recognize that you're, gonna, you're trying really hard, you're just not, hopefully that you're trying really hard, you're just not able to do it, and you're still going to get a wonderful recommendation, and that's still going to go on your resume. So. How 
how often uh, does an artist or a band come to you and suggest something or want to do something that might be against like your moral fortitude or possibly against like your business ethics or something like that? And how do you? Um, those like hilarious stories that you heard about the '80s of like having to go and get drugs and strippers and hookers, like it doesn't happen that much anymore. Unfortunately, so that's like so. It's so not fun. But um, I think that there's always there's always going to be something ethically and morally um, questionable that's going to come up. I think if you um, carry yourself the right way from the very beginning, people are going to know just not to ask you to do it. You know what I mean? I think that there's going to there's a lot of people that um, respect ambition and education and just having like a good weight about you that if you don't look like the kind of person that's going to be like, yeah, I'll totally go get you an eight ball, then you're not going to be asked to do it. You know what I mean? So. Two things. Okay. Anna, first of all, those boots are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> second off. My shoes are great too. <laughs> yeah. I was, that's what was my second. <laughs> um, for young entrepreneurs in the music school here at Belmont, what would you say, you know, if, if you had a nephew, niece, son, daughter that was 21, 22 years old, what would you recommend for them to do once they graduate? What would you personally recommend? Go to law school. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> do they want to be in the business? Yeah. Um, just hit the pavement. Just, if you want to do it, you're going to find a way to do it. That's just the bottom line. Um, it's, not, the jobs aren't sitting in, you know, in a list for you to pick through and be like, that sounds great, that sounds great, that sounds great. That's just not how it is. It's not how it ever was. Um, so you've got to be out. You've got to network. You've got to have people that are in your corner that are going to tell you when someone's hiring, you know, when there's a job somewhere else. You, that's how you find jobs. Um, we have an inner circle, you know, everyone does, and we hire people based on recommendations from people that we trust. Um, so entertainmentcareers.net is a really great resource for internships, but those aren't paid. Um, so you need to be out, you need to network, you need to hit the pavement, and you need to not get discouraged. Because, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people for positions and a lot of interns and had a lot of conversations with people that are really, really down about the industry right now, and that's the last person on the planet that I'm going to want to hire. Um, you have to be glass half full about it. This is what you guys signed up for. It's not like the industry, it's not like Napster was created two years ago. You guys have known for a while that the internet has changed things. So if, you know, if that still doesn't phase you, that's amazing, and there's always jobs for good people. But if you're 21 and you're out of college and you want to be in the music industry, it might take a minute. It might take a day. But you have to just be willing to just grind it out and, and find it and not be, um, not be entitled to the perfect job right away or the perfect salary right away or the perfect boss right away. Um, it's just, that's just not reality. You have to be willing to work really hard and bite your tongue and let somebody that's a lot older than you that doesn't even know how to work a Blackberry tell you what to do. And that's just the nature of the business. So I would tell them to just grind away. What's your favorite part about um, doing what you do? Like, what's something really cool that you do on a daily basis or just that you've done? Um, the cool part about working in film and TV was the instant gratification. You get a license, you sign off, and a week later you see a song that you place that you've been pitching wholeheartedly for months on TV, and that's amazing. So little victories like that are very, very cool. Um, and they're cool because you know that it's benefiting the bands that you're working for. And on the and, and big picture, the coolest part is sort of still being able to find enjoyment in it and not um, not ever lose sight of the fact that the reason that I got into music was X, Y, and Z, and that I can still enjoy that because that's sort of why we all are trying to do this is because there's a particular gratification that comes with knowing that we get to be behind the scenes of something that's pretty magical and letting other people in the world sort of see it and feel it if it's a band that sold 10 records or you know 10 million singles you know what I mean so it's cool when your bands get wins and it's something that you had a lot to do with and it's also really cool when you can you can remind yourself why you do what you do to kind of like keep the fire going so um, what 
internships did you do when you were at Belmont, and do you think that they actually helped you, and that you actually learned something from them that helped you eventually get the job that you did? Well, the internship that I had in New York at BMI is hands down the reason that I got my job in New York. Um, so yes, 1,000%. I wouldn't have changed that for the world, but I also wouldn't have changed um, you know, Capital Nashville when I was stuff, stuffing Keith Urban singles into an envelope, or um, Jack FM where I was, you know, handing out keychains or whatever, whatever it was. Um, you have to, you have to realize that there is a reason that you're doing everything that they ask you to do, except picking up dry cleaning and coffee. You know, and there is a reason that you're doing that because they need their dry cleaning and their coffee, but that has nothing to do with you learning how to be in the music industry. Um, but when you start working in it and it's not your job anymore to stuff those envelopes, you realize how valuable it is that there are people there that are doing it because otherwise you're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which still happens even when you're getting paid. So, um, you know, doing all of that and looking at the big picture and realizing that I am stuffing these envelopes because these CDs are getting mailed out to 500 radio stations because we're doing a big push and hopefully it's a number one single. So this company state, you know what I mean? You have to look at the big picture. So yeah, I mean, I wouldn't take back, I don't think I would take back any of my internships and I certainly advise all of you guys to really, really know why you're doing what you're doing and do it really well because there's a reason that you're being asked to do it. And um, you know, if there's a crack in the foundation that starts with you, you just don't want that responsibility because you're just an intern. You know what I mean? And if you kind of mess that up, then why would they Why would they hire you? Why would anyone hire you? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so. We had a seminar, I guess, like a year ago, talk about, someone was asking him what, what goals he had as a student, after being a student, current goals now. And um, though I'm a huge goal person, and I think goals are important, his answer was kind of like, my, I never had future goals. My goal was always to be the best at exactly where I was. And I think too often, I will say our generation, um, <clears throat> we care too much about like projecting into the future and where I want to be in five, ten years and trying to get there as opposed to you can't do that until you are the best at what you're doing, even if that is handing out Jack FM. Can I change my answer? Keychains. Yeah. I want that to be my answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll take that on the record. <laughs> what else? Yeah. As far as like starting off young, you're interning, you said you interned in high school and then all four years in college. Do you have any advice for those of us who are competing against as far as being taken seriously even though we're younger. Yeah, it's not it's not an age thing. It's <coughs> never an age thing. I mean, I I'm super young for being able to, for being I think where I am and I think that the the more confident that you are, the less it's an issue, you know. And um, the juniors and seniors might have more experience, but that doesn't mean that they're any more or less equipped to learning or doing the tasks that you're that you're delegated. Um, I think if you guys, if you're if you're up for the same job and you both have it, you both everyone has the potential to do, the, to do the same level of, you know, excellence or perfection or whatever you're striving for. But I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it being an age thing. And the less the less you make it an issue, the less it's an issue. You know. What do you wish you knew when you were at Mama? I wish I knew, I wish I saved more money when I was in college because New York is expensive. Um, what do I wish I knew? I wish I knew when I was at Belmont and now, I wish when I was younger than Belmont that I knew how important networking is. Because um, I think that I, I got to meet a lot of cool people before I came down here and just didn't, you don't really realize how important it is until you're sort of in the thick of it. So networking is, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard it a million times, but it really is incredibly important. Um, so I think I wish I knew that, I guess. When you meet someone that will, like, be a good person to be networking with, but you're not going to need to use that for, like, a couple of years, how do you, like, maintain that relationship until you're, like, a professional and need that to use it? I think that, um, I mean, there's no science or formula to networking. It, may, it puts like such a weird damper on sort of the relationship that you're trying to build with that person. I think just friendly conversation and finding something in common. And you know, if you guys talk about something, like if you guys talk about something super interesting and then you just read a book about it, you know, email them an article that you liked about the book 
you know, or you know, in, in two months, and just be like, hey, hope you're well, saw this, thought about our conversation, blah, 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 let's catch up or when we're in the same city, whatever. Um, you know, I know, I know a lot of people, and you guys will all grow to know a lot of people, but I don't do business with them every day. But I do have relationships with them and speak to them a lot and see them out and say hi how you know how are you like what's going on so you're basically just developing and you know you're using your job as an excuse to make a lot of friends What do you have to say towards, I don't know, you may not feel this now, but I know that a lot of times if I miss an opportunity, just because I need like an hour of a break, I feel really guilty about it. Oh yeah. I mean, what do you have to say towards that? I like to call that fear of missing out. I have it all the time. I have it right now and New York is getting flooded. So <laughs> that's just, that's like the extent of it. Um, you have to give yourself a break. Um, and you have to like, and, and I mean, it, you, it'll just never go away. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you like, oh, I went to like, you know, meditation classes and I learned how to relax. It just doesn't happen. But, um, you know, I think that you have to know that like you do, you, you're doing everything that you can. And as long as you are doing everything that you can, you just, you can't be everywhere. You can't do everything. So an hour of you time is plenty and it's not enough. Like you're allowed to take take as much you time as you want to feel like you're still putting yourself in the right situations to do to to get to where you are. You know what I mean? I think that there's a certain thing to be said with, you know, call it the stars aligning, call it karma, fate, whatever you want to call it. That when you work hard, they, the pieces just do fall together. Um, and sometimes you don't really realize like why is this taking so long? Why is this, you know why is this isn't why isn't this happening? Blah blah blah. And, you have to constantly put yourself, take a step back and put it into perspective of what you've done and how many miles ahead of so many other people that you are because of what you've done all week. And so when you want like five hours to like watch The Bachelor and drink a bottle of wine, do it. You know, it's like, it's totally fine. <laughs> Which is what I do for my <laughs> Just kidding, I never take a break. How in your life did you balance your schoolwork alongside your dream, your goals, and all your interns. And how did you balance it all and, and not deal with feeling guilty? Like sometimes I'll be like studying for a math test, and I'm like, I could be finding other things right now. So how did you deal with that? This is the whole, this is the question that I was like rehearsing in the mirror because I don't want to tell you guys not to study, but I also and because it is important. But I think that um, not putting so much pressure on getting straight A's and, and everything because sometimes GPAs don't. Um. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not going on to grad school, your GPA doesn't matter. Okay, that exactly. did not come from my mouth, but, I, I, but uh, if, uh, you know, like, if you're going to law school, you've got to have a good GPA, but if you, you know, if you're not going to law school, then you can kind of, you can balance it out to like a mid-level success, like B sort of thing. But um, I think that, I'll, I will tell you that when I got my job in New York, when I was a senior and I came back, I just went up to all my teachers and I was like, I got a job. Bye. <laughs> tell me what I need to do to pass. Like, I'm not coming to work. <laughs> um, it didn't work, but I tried. So, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think you just have to balance, you know, you guys do have a responsibility as students. I think a lot of your parents, if they're helping you or paying for this, would be pretty pissed to know that you're wasting their money and your time and... It is important because all of those, everything that you learn here, you really do use. Like maybe not like, um, like I don't know, art class or whatever. Like I know I don't draw for like a living, but math is important. Like I do a lot of budgets, and you do a lot of, you know, you do a lot of deal making and looking at things. And so it is all really important that it's going to apply. But I think um, if I were to choose, just is just me speaking. Like if I were to choose between overstudying for a math test and going out and meeting three new people and seeing a band that might potentially, ha like, I might be able to work with, I would choose the latter. So. I had this conversation the other day with a student. You've been raised in a structure to believe that your grades, number one, that your grades, grades, your grades, <laughs> your grades are here. Uh, your grades <laughs> define you and define success. And now there's a huge problem with that anyway, because you are not your grades, you are you, and you know, all the wonderful things that make you you. But 
it is a means to an end because your goal was to get into college, right? So your grades have always mattered, but your priorities are shifting now. Unless you want to go to law school or unless you want to go to grad school, your priority is no longer to make good grades, which means success to, to do what? You want to have a job in the industry. So you, you're, no one cares about your GPA. They want to hire you because you have a degree, not because you had a 4.0 or a 2.0, you have the same degree. So yeah. I'm not saying, those of you who have scholarships, like there's absolutely reasons to still perform your best, but yeah. release yourself, I absolve you of feeling like you've got to get great grades in college anymore. Your priorities are shifting. To be honest, there's sometimes that people that have 4.0s just aren't as, um, it's not even about being well-spoken, but personable as somebody with a 2.0 or, you know, whatever. And so I think, be, I, think, I think finding a way to sort of present yourself but still <coughs> absorb the knowledge is important. So if that means getting a, a you know, a 3.4, then I'm, that's, I think it'll be okay. I think it'll be fine. Yeah. What would you say to somebody who's uh, much more introverted? And personally, I like to have, like, handful of really good friends as opposed to just a lot of friends. How, how I start that? taking improv classes because you can't be <laughs> introverted. You'll I mean in New York at least. Maybe maybe here, but I mean part of part of your job is being able to do things for whatever company or whatever job you're representing. And being able to do that, you deal with you know tw twelve people a day per project that you're not gonna know and you are going to need to be able to call them on the phone and make them your best friend so they like you, they use your song, they give you a good price and they don't try to lowball you, they want to use you again, and they are going to sign the paperwork that you give them all in five minutes. You know what I mean? So the introverted thing is uh, something to, you know, something to work on. You've asked two questions, you're not introverted, so I wouldn't worry about it, but, you know, I, I think that it's, you have to be, you have to be memorable. There's a lot of people that are trying to do what we do. So you have to find a way to be memorable, and not in a bad way. Uh, everybody pretty much knows it takes money to make money. Uh, I work right now for a very small production company, and we just don't have the kind of money, like five to ten grand, to invest in a real kind of advertising campaign for, say, Facebook or something like that. Is there any kind of advice you can give me to help with that? Because right now I'm trying to figure out different ways to get the artists that I'm representing out there. Um, but without that kind of ad money, uh, is there any kind of advice you can give? There's a lot of ways to advertise whatever you're working with for free. Yeah. Unfortunately, you only get 140 characters to do so. Yeah. Um, but I would start just sort of pounding the social media pavement um, before you actually have to make buys. Um, it does take money to make money, but you can be you you can find ways to be really creative. Um, Ten grand is a lot of money for Facebook advertising. You could yeah. you could do it with 300. You know. Um, I don't know what your what your product is or what your person is or whatever you know, but I, you know, there's definitely ways to do it. You just have to think outside the box and kind of strike while the iron is hot and create a little bit of heat and just keep going. And then for places like um, on November fifth, he's playing in Boston, the seventh and eighth, unless it's still underwater, he's playing in New York. Um, pretty much for places that are really outside the natural reach, where I don't have any semblance of a network of at least just like people I really know. Um, that's still sort of a little bit harder or something to tackle. Is mm -hmm. that just keep at it, just keep going with it, even when you don't know as many people? One of the one of the things I think to think about in a situation like that is to look what look at what's surrounding look at what's surrounding those shows or whatever event is happening, and find ways to capitalize on the things around it um, and kind of piggyback on like if there's something bigger with a little bit more of an audience, capitalize on that for free pack free press and just sort of use what use what they're doing, kind of ride that curtail. Um, again, I don't know what I don't know what it is that you're doing or pushing, but there's there's definitely there's definitely ways to do it. There's you can promote a show in Nashville as easily as you can promote a show in New York without being there. You just have to know what's around and what works. It just takes a little bit of research and just to kind of figure out who's talking about what and how you can kind of get in there and get them to mention whatever it is that you're working on. One last question.
you have any final thoughts, words of wisdom? Um, just keep going at it. You guys are, I mean, it's a really fun time actually to be in the business. I know a lot of people say that it's not, but it's really cool and fun. And there's, don't pack up yet. I'm in the middle of something very important. Um, but yeah, it's fun. So just keep going at it and grind your teeth. And, you know, hopefully I'll see you all in the playground one day. Which I'll thank Emily for me.